Welcome everyone to another episode of Let's Have a Conversation, a podcast that discusses various topics related to McKinney-Vento Homeless Assistance Act and the educational stability for youth in foster care. We aim to increase awareness and promote education on these matters. My name is Elizabeth Fortner, and I am the Ekia Outreach and Marketing Specialist here in Region 3. And as my co-host today, I am joined by Sonia Pitsy. She is our Region 3's Ekia Program Coordinator. Hi, Sonia. Thank you so much for joining me today. Hello. My pleasure. And I am also joined by Jeff Zimmerman and Andy Cool. Jeff is a dedicated professional who helps at-risk youth by working with schools, shelters, and agencies to eliminate barriers and ensure necessary services. He is the Region 7 Homeless and Foster Care Coordinator in Northeast Pennsylvania, covering 17 counties and collaborating with 86 local education agencies. Jeff also organizes charitable events, <clears throat> and educates organizations about the challenges faced by homeless and foster children. Andy Cool has 40 years of experience in education, holding positions such as superintendent, curriculum director, principal, and teacher in various school districts. He graduated from Dickinson College with a bachelor's degree in political science and received his master's degree in educational leadership from Temple University. Andy has also been involved with Pennsylvania Association of School Administrators and is a part of Region 7's PA Ekia program. So let's give a very warm welcome to our guest speakers. Thank you so much, Jeff and Andy, for joining us today. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you for having us. Absolutely. So let's have a conversation. So I just want you both to just start off. Tell us a little bit about yourselves and what you do. Jeff, you got to unmute yourself, buddy. All right. Yeah, now we're going. Uh, now we're okay. Going. Uh, yes, I am the Region 7 Coordinator for uh, for Homeless and Foster Children here up in Northeast Pennsylvania. Actually, before this, I had uh, I was working in an alternative school for about 10 years. I have worked in uh, other educational settings as well. Actually, for a year in Carolina, I did um, a little bit of drug and alcohol for uh, prevention for adolescents. So my experience is mostly with at risk youth in the, like as far as um, my occupation. Not something that I went to college for, but it just kind of fell into my lap. And uh, so it's been, um, but yeah, it's been, you know, challenging, but, you know, but rewarding, very rewarding at times. So I, I will have to say, Jeff, that while I didn't go into college to do what we are doing either, I feel mm -hmm. like um, our college directed and built a foundation and then our professional experience has really built us to what we needed to be for regional coordinators for this program. So, um, and we'll, I know we'll be talking more about that and how that falls in. So, uh, yeah, it's it's funny how when you're young and in your twenties, well, this is stuff you yeah. can't learn in a book. <laughs> That's a, really exactly can. right. And there were a lot of building blocks, you know, that led us to where we are today. And uh, you know, and I'm glad. I'm very happy for the experience that I've had in the past. Uh, taught me a lot, taught me a lot because, um, you know, just it is what it, it is kind of what they usually say, like you don't learn until you're actually on the job. And, um, you know, you can learn a lot, you know, you can learn some things in a book, but not everything. And, um, you know, so when you, once you get into it and that's pretty much, you know, what I've been doing and I keep learning, you know, I keep learning as we go. I think I I think I have a unique perspective of uh, this program because through my time uh, as an administrator, we uh, unfortunately did not have the infrastructure in place that we do now for the identification and the aid to, to go to homeless families and, student, and those students in need. In fact, our, our, our policies uh, at, the, at the initial part of my career 
was that if we had students who we identify today as homeless students, we were turning them away from our school districts because they didn't have the required documentation and the paperwork and the address in the school district. And we were we were held to requirements by the local boards of education to only allow students who had uh, verified addresses in our district to to become registered. And it was uh, kind of through the the evolution of, of, of my time as administrator to, uh, to to see this program become implemented and 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 grow and and it's still a, a, a process as we we educate those who have, have been doing this um what the mandates of, of the program are um i think schools have always tried to help at risk and, and needy students but now we've we've put the the infrastructure in place to to specifically identify and aid homeless students And I think what you said, Andy, is really important. It wasn't until really, um, I've been doing this for 26 years, specifically with McKinney-Vento, and it really wasn't until the regional approach where every Pennsylvania school district had a regional coordinator to be able to help assist every school district to build that foundation of what the policy was uh, for the to follow the federal law. Because while the federal law was there, there really wasn't anything to support and assist uh, districts to be able to do that. And if you weren't one of the 14, 17 school districts prior to the regional approach that received McKinney-Vento funds, you just didn't really have it on your radar. So uh, it, it when we went regional, I know it was something that we had to build a foundation on working with all of our districts. And the fact that Jeff has the largest region of the whole, you know, of eight of us <laughs> and has been able to do, uh, you know, work and build that foundation is great. And Andy, I know I, I've known you in, off and on as you've gone from different roles and now as a consultant, um, I, I've appreciated your viewpoints and I, I'm sure that has helped Jeff in his region and also lead as an example in the region. Well, well there's no doubt that that um in the initial in the initial phases of this as, as Jeff began to implement this in, in in our region um our our local administrators saw this as a program that provided transportation to homeless students and that was probably about all and 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 that was evidenced by the fact that so many school districts just made their transportation director their McKinney Vinto liaison um and 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 it, that, that initial, while while it was great that the liaisons were being named, unfortunately, you were getting a person that didn't have the educational input into the needs of the students or the social or emotional needs, um, and, and the concern was just getting them to school and getting them home, and, and, and so we we've, we've expanded that, and I think that 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 Sonia, you hit it right on the head that that regional approach, and then the 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 sharing and, and the the um, the, the implementation of all the other things that go along with it, um, it, it has, has become valuable. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that um, the regional approach was something that was actually new. Uh, I think you got to mute. Was uh, was something new. I, I remember it was implemented only a couple of months after us. After I after I took over as regional coordinator, and I think that some of the requirements and the monitoring and the data and things like that started coming in. The program grew, and you know, and it's funny because I compare it to the foster program sometimes. And the foster program, I could see, you know, the struggles that we had in the beginning of the of the foster program. Uh, as uh, as compared to the McKinney Vinto that already had legs, you know, that was going and we were, you know, implementing things and things were starting to come together a little more. And I saw that with the five. Now, the foster program is going much better. And I think that it's a lot better than when it was, uh, you know, when it was first when the law was first passed. But, you know, but yeah, you can see the differences in the two programs. And, uh, you know, and I, I but I think the foster program is catching up. And, um, you know, we're constantly working with school districts and, and children and youth agencies and talking about um, what's what, like a lot of the needs that these kids have. And 
well, it'll just lead us into our, you know, what we're talking about next is, you know, uh, we've gotten over a lot of the humps, like as far as, okay, we know that we can enroll without documentation. We know that we have to set up transportation, but that's not where it ends. And that's where um, we're kind of at our office. We're focusing on that now is like, all right, now what are we going to do after we've have everything in place? We've gotten their backpacks. We've gotten their school supplies. Um, everything's in place. They're going to school. They're enrolled. Well, now we have to start focusing. And that's what we've been trying to have conversations with our liaisons about what they should be doing after and just identification. To, and just to back it up a little bit uh, to to what Jeff is saying, uh, foster care truly currently in its current phase is in its infancy. Uh, I started this with McKinney Vento with the school district of the city of York in 1995. It did not go regional until 2007, I believe. And that is when uh, then became regional approach where it, we had the eight coordinators. And when it was in 1995, until the regional approach, we had 14 to 17 sites. So that was only 14 to 17 school districts or a couple of intermediate units because there were some that had school districts and there were a couple of intermediates that had the grants that did it. Um, and I remember coming in and it being McKinney Vento being in its infancy. And if we had not had the foundational regional approach in place prior to ESSA and foster care coming around uh, in, in 2015, we would not be as far ahead as we are compared to McKinney Vento. And it's because we had the knowledge and the regional coordinators in place to be able to say, okay, now this is something else we have to implement. Foster care is not new, but ESSA is new. And now we need to get this information out and we need to identify and we need to have these processes in place. And then, as Jeff said, once now we've got this done, now what? We, we've taken care of the what, which is McKinney Vento and ESSA and foster care. Now what? So now that we have given them their basics, we've identified them, we've given them school supplies. Do we just say, here you go, and we're completely done? No. So now what? That's our conversation. Absolutely. And that's, the, I, I think, where our understanding and working with, um, and I think we've all had experience with this, is working with at-risk youth is, ex is uh, our background is, is uh, very important as far as experience. And um, understanding like that every child is unique and every child comes from unique situations and some of the things that they've been through, some of the trauma that they've experienced um, that not only do we have to understand, I mean, I think it's more important that the schools understand it. And, you know, I mean, you have a child that all of a sudden has gone through these traumatic situations and a lot of them have been going through these traumatic situations for a while. And you know, for them to walk into a school, I, people need to understand the, where they're coming from. And the best uh, thing that I heard was it was a, in a trauma informed training where the woman said, imagine if you're being chased by a bear. Yeah. And, um, you know, the, like the experience that you have, like, you know, you, you get all you, you know, you, your blood, so your adrenaline goes up, you're, you know, you're right, you might not remember everything that's happening and <laughs> you're trying to get away. But they said, you know, imagine that bear chasing you uh, every day, all the time, you know, and that's kind of what these a lot of these kids are experiencing as far as their trauma. And, um, you know, so I, I think that you know, everyone needs to kind of understand that, you know, a lot of these kids uh, aren't coming from healthy backgrounds in some cases. And I mean, Hey, we do have situations and I'm not, I'm not gonna, you know, say that's everybody. We do have some just unfortunate situations, you know, where they are coming from good families and then, you know, that something happens like a natural disaster and they, they become misplaced, things like that. But we definitely should be investigating, you know. And, and that's still trauma. That's still that's Absolutely. still something that has caused anxiety that has mm -hmm. put people in a crisis mode. And crisis mode is no way to live. Yet all of our families and 
uh, foster care and experiencing homelessness uh, are experiencing crisis. Those students come to school feeling that crisis, uh, whether things are under control or not because of the uncertainty of their day to day. So and trauma looks very different. I think, mm-hmm. you know, what trauma that's might true. be for one student may not be for the other. And I think when delivering those services, what works for one may not work for the other. So, and you know, what, you a know, lot of the, yeah, you're right. And you a have lot to of meet the them kids, where they're at. A lot of the kids, even that have experienced trauma, have developed these defense mechanisms where you might, it, it might be harder to crack that shell and like get through that and understand what's going on. Right. Um, you know, if they've been experiencing trauma since they've been uh, very little, they might have developed, a, you know, the system. They, they might think that it's normal in a lot of cases. So, I mean, it's it's really important that we, um, you know, that we have counselors or liaisons or whoever they feel, you know, at least talking to them. Like we're always talking about um, referrals to SAP teams and and trauma informed teams and things of that nature because um, these are these are extremely important and and as we always say the one thing that we don't want happening is when they are homeless or foster is if they for whatever reason they they get uh suppose they become permanently housed or now they're no longer in foster care it doesn't mean that that trauma has ended we want them to continue those services and um, so we've been, and, uh, so we've been kind of stressing that in a lot of our trainings and, um, you know, a lot of the things that we're, we're, that we're speaking about are some of the supports that are in place for these kids. So like after identification. I, I think Jeff has led us in a good direction. Um, it's something that we've emphasized in our region and I, 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 I see more widespread now is the marriage of, of many programs what I mean by that is um, the, 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 the homeless liaison doesn't stand alone in their work with the kids. Um, the foster point of contact is, is, is not on an island. That, that we, are, we are marrying the, the trauma-informed teams in the schools with the SAP teams, with the homeless liaison, with the foster point of contact. And now we introduce, uh, for many of our students, an, an act one point of contact who's also working with the students on, on a, a, a graduation plan or, or academic goals. So um, this, this uh, comprehensive approach of, of, of getting everyone in the school community involved with helping the kids, um, I, I believe that that'll stop kids from falling through the cracks that fell through the cracks before because there are many sets of eyes on that kid and, and many areas of support. And as Jeff mentioned, it, it's not something that uh, when this kid becomes housed or comes out of foster care, um, that now there's there, there's no more support in place. Now it continues with the SAP team or the trauma-informed team. Uh, we're very fortunate in our area to see that so many school districts now are, are hiring social workers um, that, that become parts of those, those comprehensive student support teams that, that are there and are there for, for long-term support for the kids. Um, so, so that's a great direction, and, and, and I, I'd like to see that um, maybe go from from where we are with with our, our feet on the ground here up to the state level, where the 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 the, the state begins to to marry some of these programs, um, provide training across the board, and and recognize um, that that this is something that that needs to be done from from from. Uh, the wide approach uh, from the state. Yeah. And you know what? We have a lot of, um, what, when we're talking with our liaisons, like a lot of the, uh, what we're trying to do is, you know, we're telling them, come up with some sort of plan, you know, as far as uh, like talking with the parent, talking with the student, the one thing we do understand that, uh, you know, some of our larger districts are going to have challenges. All right. If you have a lot of homeless students, that's why what Andy said was important. It can't just be the liaison in those districts. We need more support. And that's what we're trying to tell them is, you know, get your guidance counselors involved or whoever it might be, because you want somebody regularly checking up because we all know that, you know, in a homeless situation, 
um, or a foster situation, that their needs are going to change as time goes on. I mean, uh, one week, you know, it could be, hey, you know what, they're having trouble, you know, finding clothes or whatever it might be. The next week it might be, hey, guess what? We found out that they're they're behind academically and we need some tutoring services. And And if you're not regularly checking in with that family or with that student, or monitoring those situations, you're not going to know, or suppose that they had a problem on the van or, you know, whatever it might be, but you have to keep that door open all the time. And, um, you know, and I think that, you know, with some of the, you know, and it's going to depend on every student, but one of the things that we always talk about in our trainings uh, with at-risk youth is, you know, we don't expect, like, uh, I think a lot of the expectations that are put on students is, well, they're, you know, and families, I should say, is that they're going to self-identify. They're going to tell you their problems. Not all, not the case. Okay. Especially with a, especially with a student who um, has learned to mistrust adults. If they've had adults in their life that have not, um, that have lied to them or have disappointed them or abused them or whatever it might be, they might not have that relation. They, they might not, um, be as willing to come out with things because they think, well, you know what, if I do this, I'm going to get in trouble or I'm going to get, or I'm going to get into this situation and, and it's, it's, it's not going to help anything. So I think that a lot of students um, aren't going, especially when you get up in their teenage years, because they're trying to hide it from their peers, you know, and um, you know, and they don't want people to know their situation in a lot of cases. So I think that, you know, having that, soft approach you know and like and and letting them know that you're there to help them is very important and you know and you have to again regularly check on them i you know i always say you're not going to crack them sometimes in the beginning some of them will you know they're not going to get like you know just like anybody i always tell i said well if you walk up to a stranger do you trust them right away no no you know that's a it's something you have to build upon so, you know, I mean, and that's, and I think that that's very important for everyone to understand that trust isn't just given to anybody. And so, you know, some of these situations, at-risk situations that they're in, you know, it might take them a little while to, to get through and open up about it. So I I'd, I'd kind of like to touch on that a little bit because, um, and, and we'll focus this a little bit more, and we'll cover all of the populations, but focusing in on what you said specifically about teenagers, um, Jeff, and I know that from a struggle point, a lot of our districts still struggle with the unaccompanied youth definition. The younger ones, they tend to allow a lot more grace for, they mm -hmm. allow a lot more flexibility for they don't question it as much it's when they get into that teenage phase where they're just like well you know why why are we calling them an unaccompanied youth why aren't we doing affidavits guardianship that that term that uh notarized thing that i do not like um <laughs> and also right. uh, i i i just recently did a, a training and um i'd like to get your take on how you would have answered both from andy and jeff uh, where the person was an administrator and was telling me that basically, Sonia, you're telling me that the parents have no rights. Parents do not have the right to parent. I'm like, no, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that this, this is a definition of an unaccompanied youth. Your job is to educate them. Our job is not to judge them. We need to make sure that they're there. Well, what if they say they don't don't want to throw out the garbage and that, you know, now you're telling the parents that it doesn't matter, that they don't have to have curfew. They don't have to do that. I'm like, OK, we're talking about two very separate things. And I I know I I and, and then it became a financial thing. And I'm like, uncompanied teenagers are not getting money. I'm not sure where you're getting that. But then it was well, but taxpayers are paying for this. It's like, OK, again. I'm just trying to, we are educators and we need to educate and follow this law for this. If you want to report runaways, that's a separate, that's a separate thing that parents and police can go into, but how would you respond and how do we continue the conversation? Because it continues to come up and it has come up, Jeff, as you know, you and I have done 
presentations together right. and, and um you know and, and it has been this conversation since i've since i was 25 uh, to you know now how do we get folks to understand that the unaccompanied youth especially those who are older still have these qualifications and how can we work with them and when people say that well they lie okay that's mm-hmm. a defense mechanism we anyone who's been trained in trauma knows that that can be a defense mechanism mm-hmm. and to your point they don't have they have trust issues so we need to find someone to trust them so how do we work with the districts to support them in in building that how would you what would you say to help them form the now what portion of that so to both you and Andy from Andy's experience in the school district system and you know and Jeff you're all encompassing experience as well well, uh, the thing I always say is sometimes they're getting some of the information in my mind. I, I like in a lot of these cases, say maybe they are getting all the information, but I, I, I don't think that I always tell them that um, 90% of the time is if you talk to an adult, you know, in that family, they're going to tell you they don't want to follow the rules. All right. They're not going to tell you about anything that's going on behind closed doors. I mean, why would they? I mean, you know, I mean, they're going to tell you that they're abusing the child. They're not going to say that. And, you know, so if there is, a, you know, something that is leading this child or, you know, student to leave the home, you know, I, I think that there are underlying issues that aren't being talked about there. Now, I'm not saying what I usually say is, look, the law is clear. We are not there to judge who's right or wrong. We are there looking at the situation. Uh, the thing is, um, I and I always say, look, I'm not saying the parents always right. I'm not saying the students always right. What I'm saying is we don't know. And them as an administrator, I don't care if it's their brother. They still don't know what goes on once that door closes. And you know what? And that's uh, look at we're looking at the situation, and that's all. That's as far as we go. Uh, you know, I'm not going to get into the financial end of it because we can argue that forever. But you know the, but this is these programs and the McKinney Vinto money and, and and Title One money and things like that. That's all that was all put in place. You know, for things like this. All right. Well, there, there is federal money out there for that. So, you know, in my mind, you know, that's not even that shouldn't even be an argument. I mean, we're, we're like financially. I mean, we're always talking about educate our priority. Our priority is educating that child and you know what? And helping them any way we can. And you know what? And as far as the lying part. Yeah. You know what? We've, the parents lie. The kids lie. They all lie. It doesn't mean because they lie that they don't have a right to an education, right? It's, it's, it's not, um, we've had that happen, you know, here at, at the office many times. And, and I said, I go, and I've heard that from liaisons and they get upset. I understand that, you know, I do understand that, but I mean, like you said, Sonia, I mean, a lot of that might come from their background and it might be because, you know, that is, you know, what they've learned to do, because they don't want to get in trouble or, or maybe that's what they're doing to self-preserve, whatever the reason might be. But you know what, that's no reason to, um, you know, again, we have to keep in mind what we're there for and, and that's to help the child and educate the child. So that's kind of how I would do it. We've had a, you know, we've, we've had some administrators over time, you know, uh, get a little heated with us about that. But um, I said, well, you know, we can run it up the line. I said, but we're going to be right, you know, and I said, even like even most of the time, uh, you know, I can if I start talking to, you know, the legal team and things like that, usually they're going to side with the child because, you know what, that's what we're here for. That's what the Department of Education is uh, prioritizes is education. So, you know, but. Sure. There is no doubt that this is this can get extremely tricky, and it, and it's a difficult uh, a difficult proposition sometimes for administrators. Um, if if we have that 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 seventeen year old unaccompanied youth who presents themselves to register in a school district, 
um, and, and, and their reasons for being there sometimes may be nefarious. I mean, I, I, I've, I've had it with, with kids who came to, uh, to stalk their girlfriend and, or, or, or do, the, 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 my, my feeling on this has changed and, and I'll be perfectly honest with you from the beginning of my career as an administrator was to shut that kid out, close the door and with a sweeping, sweeping the wide, a wide swath, do not accept those kids. I've come to learn that I was breaking the law at the time um, and needed to look at those situations. And I needed to learn that the responsibility of, of recognizing that later on was on me. And I had to get the kid in the school. One of the lessons that I learned was when a kid came in those situations and we didn't allow them in the school. And a few days later, uh, children youth came looking for the kid because they had been in danger. Had we let that kid in a school, we'd know where they were when 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 they came looking for them. We'd be able to to put uh, a, 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 some some connection for them to get the the, the outside service they needed. Uh, I was kind of uh, brought into uh, administration at a time when. We believe the parents, we believe the parents to be right 100% of the time and didn't always follow um, what the kids said. Um, we, we, we've now, and, and it's, it, it takes time. And I, I think the, the new generation is starting to recognize that kids sometimes are doing the right thing. They're getting themselves out of a bad situation. Um, and, and that's why you find them on your doorstep sometimes. So, it's just a matter, and this is not a a, a a a revolutionary process. This is evolutionary. It's going to take time. It's going to take time to get this down to all administrators, all school staff, to, to recognize this. And it, it it it's not something that that would be will, will will change overnight, but it is changing. It's it's slowly but surely. Um, changing through programs like ours that that are are out there and and getting that identification out there, and I, I think that lends itself to another point. Um, as a superintendent, one of the things that that I didn't realize was the the role and the demands that were on the liaison, and that the liaison was going to play a, a, an important part in knowing the intricacies of identifying. A homeless child and um you know sometimes you just put it on the plate of the person who was next in line and and i think that 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 a, a, a big part of what we need to do is to get to those people in leadership and for them to understand the role of the liaison before they go and make that assignment. And don't just give it to the person who's next in line, but give it to the person who has the capacity and the capability of doing the job. Because those decisions in your school district will be much easier when you have that knowledgeable person in place to, to help make those decisions. Um, you, you can't expect a person at registration to be able to make that decision they should be trained to recognize and then get the liaison involved. But it's important that, that we get to our leadership people and say, you got to get the right people in the job so that we could we, we could have a successful program. Andy, I, I truly appreciate that you shared that that at the beginning of this and you know in your your infancy of of working with the McKinney Vento Act and 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 what you initially did and how things have historically been you believe the parent and all of that I really appreciate that you uh shared that you didn't that you you know the, the teenagers were believed and this was just not a thing and and that um once you found out the law it's like oh yeah we're breaking the law but and it is evolving. It, it, it one of the it, it's continually evolving. I agree with that statement one hundred percent. That people are starting to get it, and then what happens in the school district end is that position positions change, and people change in positions. So now you have someone new coming in, and um, and I think that getting 
to your point, Andy, getting to leadership is absolutely key because leadership is how is going to be able to continue to allow us as regional coordinators make sure that every school district is in compliance. I will say that from a regional coordinator perspective, we have had consistent coordinators who have been allowed to get to know our districts. And because of that, uh, when we've had new liaisons, because we get changes, at least 20 changes, it seems like every school year, right, Jeff, Uh, where we have a new liaison. And we always make sure to meet with the new liaison to talk with them. But then the liaison is all of a sudden like, we have a whole page of responsibilities you want me to know and learn about McKinney Vento. However, if there's a team who has learned about this, especially from the leadership, uh, and then social workers, guidance counselors, secretaries, uh, transportation, nurses, all of those folks, it's not just on the liaison. But I can't stress enough how important it is to have that leadership support and to know that that leadership is willing to have the conversation, is willing to say, you know, yeah, I, I'm sure at times I've taken it personally and I shouldn't take it personally. And yes, you, we, if they're in school, we know where they are. And that's what I try to say to them is like, you know, if they're in school, you know where they are seven hours out of the day. And we just want them to get into school and you, we need to educate them. That's the bottom line, as well as we are making sure that you are in compliance with the law. We're not saying these things to make everybody homeless which is something I get all the time. Sonia, you want everybody to be homeless. You're this bleeding heart liberal. No, I tell you what the law is and I want you to comply. And here's how you can comply and what it can look like for you in your district, because also every district is different. Even within the same county, neighboring districts are different. But we can work together to make that happen. So um, it is ever evolving. And I think that's why we need to always continue to have the conversations and be willing to willing to have the conversations is the other key piece of that willing to have open minds to how it can be versus how it has been historically yeah and i agree with you sonny um we were we've always talked about that with the liaison uh you know we wanted somebody in a position um of authority in the school district but somebody who understands you know, all ends of it, you know, they understand a little bit of the financial, but, you know, like they understand the education part of it um, and they buy into the program, you know, and they really make an effort to get other people in the district involved. I mean, we've seen the difference. We have some school districts that totally buy into the program and it's unbelievable, you know, the difference between it. And I always say, you know, I think that if you have a well (laughs) <laughs> if you have a great program in place, I honestly think that things go easier for you with your homeless population as opposed to like, you know, to resisting. Uh, you're constantly in fights and you're constantly calling people. If you have a, a something that it's, you know, boom, 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 you know, like I, you, you have the services in place, you have everything, you know, right up front that the student has an easy transition into the school. And then afterwards, you know, you have a plan in place for that student, you know, after the identification or what you're going to do. I think that um, we're getting, you know, I think that, you know, because of course we want to stabilize those needs and that's, that's the goal. And I said, you know, I mean, I think that it's just not, it's not only that it's easier on not only the, you know, the families and the student, but it's easier on the staff and the school district. I mean, I, I, I truly believe that. And, uh, you know, that's kind of one of the things that we're trying to do is, you know, convince people of that, I guess you can say is, and, you know, and um, put those supports in place and, and let them know, you know, this is what we can, how we can help you from our office. But, you know, and we've come up with, and Andy has been, a, you know, of course, a great addition to this program, and he's come up with a lot of different ideas, and um, we've given tons of different documents and examples out to uh, school districts, you know, on like, I mean, just little basic things like here, you know, this is what you do after the identification, here's a checklist for you, you know, um, things like that. I mean, just to make it a little bit easier, maybe as far as paperwork, but um but yeah, if you buy into the program, again, I think that uh, things go a lot smoother. 
And, uh, you know, we're not, we're not here to, you know, create homelessness either. It's out there. We're just trying to find them. And I'm envious you have Andy, because I, I know as from an administrator and to now his role, you know, where he's at in life and, and helping you out and assist. It, it's just a great perspective that he can bring and offer to uh, you that I then can s- steal ideas <laughs> or I'm sorry, I mean, collaborate, Jeff, with you <laughs> <too. laughs> um, as, as we, you know, develop our different resources, because we do need to know how to uh, talk to our districts at all levels and uh, being able to say, well, we've spoken with or we've worked with administrators and these administrators have suggested this. And this is the resource that we are offering to you that may assist in your district, adapt it as you need. Here's just a starting point. Here's once once it's been identified, now, what do we need to do to help support this family and the, the student in their education and in their whole life? Because we also recognize that just because we're giving them an education, that does not solve everything's, everything in their life, nor are we trying to solve everything in their life. But, but we do also want to make sure that we can have the resources on our end to know what we can offer. Uh, and having someone in the a social work guidance counselor, secretary, or just a, a list of resources that uh, the app has, Finding Your Way in PA app that has those resources for housing, food, all of those things that are so important for these students and families to try to get out of school um, and have those supports. It, it, we need to have those things in place. So it's What's great about, again, the regional approach is that we share information and resources, and we certainly can have those links and stuff when we put this podcast up, but it's always important to have feedback from everyone who's in there, our liaisons um, on up to our, you know, co-workers. It's, I mean, Jeff and I, you you and I have, we present, when did you first start coming to this, Jeff? Uh, You were after Lori, so. Yeah, it was 2010. I, I i started um, holy yeah, buckets was, yeah it's been a little about 14 years holy but buckets jeff we I have know. caused some we have caused some good trouble in those 14 years yeah exactly <laughs> uh, uh going into presentations that we uh were able to uh didn't know that we were going to be co-presenters until we started getting questions from all sides right. And we're just like, okay, well, this is how it works in Northeast and how it works in South Central and how it should work because it's a federal law. (laughs) And it's not just Jeff saying or it's not just Sonia saying it. And we still are evolving. I mean, I Mm -hmm. I love that word that Andy said. We're still, you know, you you and I have been collaborating on many things for 14 years and have built things that have been great foundations for this for the statewide model. Um. And uh, it's it's great that we continue to do this and use Andy and his capacity for as long as you can, Jeff. Yeah. <laughs> oh, for sure. Yes. Yeah. And uh, Andy, we will certainly be using you uh, in our future <laughs> while you, while we have you for the next year um, to 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 speak specifically from your from your lens as an administrator and to other administrators and leaderships, because I think. We don't have power as regional coordinators. And I say that, I'm like, we don't have any power other than the law, which is pretty powerful. And you don't want to lose a lawsuit. And there are schools in the Pennsylvania who have lost the lawsuit and McKinney Vento lawsuit and have lost millions. We're trying to prevent that from our folks, from our folks having that issue. So, um, yeah. And honestly, so, I think that Andy, you can provide you do have that personal experience where you were them at one point. And I think a lot of individuals can relate and will be more open to, okay, you know, maybe I need to do better. Maybe I need to learn a bit more, educate myself because it's not just me. You know, he was obviously at that point in his career and then it turned around for him. So I think you bring a whole other perspective that I think individuals will definitely listen to. And definitely take the advice because they were they are how you were. So well, I you think- know what? 
I agree. And you know what? And I've taken advantage of Andy. And I don't think he <laughs> liked it in the beginning. I don't think he liked it in the beginning because I would say he was because of just what you guys said. Um, a lot of them think, you know, that I'm not going to understand their position. And so I said, well, here's Andy. Here's a super, he's a superintendent. He does, you know, so, and, you know, and that's, and that, and that does help. I mean, I, I'm not going to lie. So, um, and not only that, but, you know, he can answer a lot of questions in about a school district that I can't, you know, um, you know, it's because he's been in those, in those positions. Um, and it does help, you know, and that's, you know, yeah, he's been, you know, like as far as contributing to the program and seeing it, yeah, seeing it from that perspective. And yeah, it, it is something different. I, and yeah, and I always appreciated it, you know, so, um, but Andy, yeah. I've been, and, Andy, I've been using your name too. Just want you to know. So <laughs> You're the just, power tool we pull out at the yeah. end. Mic drop. I'm just Boom. like, you know, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Everyone's like, who are you? I'm like, Andy, cool. You know who Andy cool is. But I, I truly appreciate that you both took your time out uh, this last hour and plus to to talk with us and are willing to yes. always help. Um, I've always appreciated you both. Uh, Jeff, I've always appreciated the uh, professional collaboration that we always have, that mm -hmm. we can just oh, yeah. bounce ideas off of each other. And we have things that make sense. We also acknowledge the 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 challenges and are like, yeah, we know that that does suck. We know that people lie. We know that this, and we yeah. still have to do this, <laughs> you yeah. know, and it's, and it's uh, so I, I just truly appreciate you both for doing this and for uh, whether you verbally said it or not are willing to help in the, <laughs> in the <laughs> next 12 months as we move forward. And Jeff, of course, you know, uh, yeah, anytime you call, I will come and do whatever you need me to do. Well, Jeff, Andy and Sonia, I truly thank you three for being a part of this conversation. You three offer such a unique perspective along with personal experience that cannot be taught. I do appreciate all the insight that you three brought. And I, I, I truly have learned so much from you. And I am very honored that I get to work with such great individuals such as yourselves. So we invite everyone to join us again next month for another episode of Let's Have a Conversation. So thank you, everyone. Thanks, Thanks for having us. us.